Hello students, welcome to this one more vertical integration session between pharmacology and uh, uh, general medicine. Myself, Dr. Nilesh, your pharmacology faculty. And I'm Dr. Rahul Rajiv, your general medicine faculty. So today we'll be discussing a question which is very important, not just from the entrance point of view, but for your practice as well. Okay, so let's proceed with the question. So the question is regarding a 50 year old male. Okay, and uh, he this patient was detected to have diabetes for the past three years and is on lifestyle modification and on drug metformin, right? So we're talking of a diabetic patient. So this patient is also an asthmatic and uh, he is on an as needed budesonide formatrol, which means he is on a combination of inhaled corticosteroid and a LABA, long acting beta agonist. So he is on an ICS LABA combination as and when needed, that is as and when he develops the symptoms. In a health camp that was conducted in his district, he is now detected to have a blood pressure of 160 systolic and 104 diastolic. Okay, so it's a newly detected systemic hypertension. Okay, all right. And uh, on subsequent evaluation, the HbA1c was 7 percentage. Okay, and the urine examination showed 1 plus albuminuria. The other lab parameters, maybe the liver function test, renal function test, everything was within normal limits. The question is, which of the following antihypertensive will you prefer as first line in this patient? The options are propranolol, prasusin, spironolactone and telmisartan. So, you know, this is a common clinical scenario in routine practice as well about the choice of antihypertensives in different clinical scenario because see this patient is a newly detected hypertensive you've got to start medication now as a first line when you think of an agent in this patient always have a look in toto the case scenario this patient is a diabetic for past three years and you can see the hba1c is on the higher side which tells us an indication sir that it's not a well-controlled diabetes Okay, and he's having 1 plus albuminuria. See, when you think of antihypertensives, okay, uh, there is one antihypertensive which can retard the progression of albuminuria. Now, why am I so concerned of albuminuria? Isn't just that a biochemical indicator of albumin urine? No. See, uh, in a patient who is a diabetic, in the early stages, you know, when the nephropathy actually sets in, Initially, you might just have an albuminuria. And albumin per se is tubulotoxic. Okay, so to the nephrons, excretion of albumin will have some toxic effects, which can actually lead on to further albuminuria and also the patient going on to a diabetic kidney disease. Okay, so it's a progressive disease course. So in this patient, the antihypertensive which you can choose one of the agent which actually prevents in fact the agent which will help to retard the progression of albuminuria is the group of AC inhibitors and ARBs okay so not just with respect to preventing the progression of albuminuria even otherwise this is always a preferred first line agent AC inhibitors and ARBs and considering the comorbidity of diabetes and the albuminuria in this patient. So I think definitely my top choice will be option D that is telmisartan which is a angiotensin receptor blocker. Okay. And also now, sir I want to add one more thing that we have to give either an AC inhibitor or an ARB. Yeah. It shouldn't be given in combination because of one important pharmacological adverse effect and that is hyperkalemia. hyperkalemia. Very important. Make sure that that yeah. So don't give it together. Okay. There is no added advantage of adding both of them together as well. Okay. So which is very important as sir said. So in this patient, tell me certain. And when you think of other options, you know, let's try to see the other options as well. Uh, because the answer is quite clear, straightforward here. But See, another point is when you think of the first option, propranolol, sir, you know, the patient is also asthmatic. Yeah. So, 
he is on an ICS laba and propranolol obviously is a beta blocker so can cause bronchospasm exacerbation of bronchospasm sir can you take us through the other options you know what are the important points that they should keep in mind which uh, will help them not just for the entrance as well as for the practice because they should have a basic knowledge right sir about these individual agents when they can be used what are the common adverse effects that you should keep in mind so can you please throw some light into that sure sir sure see guys actually uh, uh, what uh, what we feel is the cardiovascular system in pharmacology is going to be uh, uh, is going to have a lot of impact in practice because uh, because it's going to be very much common the hypertension we have we have cardiac failure we have angina mi and we have arrhythmia lots of implications are there in the practice and every individual point directly comes back to pharmacology so we need to have every individual to say uh, as much knowledge as possible especially in terms of two major systems i want to propose one is cardiovascular system the other one is central nervous system both of these systems uh, tend to have a lot of implications of what we learn in pharmacology and how we are going to apply it in terms of treatment of a particular patient let's uh, uh, let's go through the first option now we have propranolol this propranolol uh, uh, we know that it is not a cardio selective beta blocker it is purely a non selective beta blocker we have lots of cardio selective beta blockers too which includes the famous drug nebivalol is there it's a famous cardio selective beta blocker but here that was not an option here it has been given as propranolol why they have given used this option propranolol is actually one of the most beautiful beautifully placed option here because they have already given that this patient is non asthma non asthmatic and he is under treatment as on as uh, when on need treatment so this is a non selective beta blocker which means it tends to block both the beta 1 receptors and also beta 2 receptors there is going to be beta 1 blockade and also there is going to be beta 2 blockade this beta 1 blockade can be useful for the treatment of hypertension but it has got lots of limitations that's what we are going to talk about in this condition in this uh, uh, thing beta 1 blockade because of this beta 1 blockade we have to make sure that these beta blockers are not given in terms of a patient who have already been diagnosed as bradycardic Okay. who is already bradycardic we shouldn't be administering any of uh, administering any of the beta blockers the first point and the next one is this beta 1 blockade we have lots of implications the next one if a patient has been known cardiac conduction defects if the patient is going uh, be having av block uh, known case of av block we shouldn't be prescribing beta blockers exactly. and also most important interaction in pharmacology i hope you guys can remember it beta blockers with uh, cardio selective calcium channel blockers is ex this combination is exactly contraindicated in av block a famous question repeatedly asked question yes, also yes so in terms of cardiac conduction defects this uh, beta blocker shouldn't be administered what about beta 2 why aren't we administering this drug in this patient is because beta 2 receptors is getting blocked beta 2 is what type of a receptor guys g yes we know all the beta receptors are all g yes receptors what's the nature of gs receptors smooth muscle relaxation so this is going to produce smooth muscle relaxation but propranolol blocks it produces smooth muscle contraction that's the reason why this drug is contraindicated in terms of bronchial asthma and also as it is producing smooth muscle contraction propranolol is producing smooth muscle contraction this drug is also contraindicated in terms of peripheral vascular diseases this Uh, uh vessel constrictive property is actually applied sir we know that because propranolol is currently being treated as the first drug of choice in terms of prophylaxis of migraine yeah because this is the mechanism behind it we know migraine is because of vasodilatation propranolol tend to produce vasoconstriction so that's the reason why this propranolol can be has been approved as a treatment for not as a treatment as a prophylaxis of migraine we know the treatment of migraine is going to be triptans on this now let's move to the second option prazosin so what is a prazosin guys prazosin is actually a alpha blocker it is an alpha blocker this is is it a selective or a non selective fantastic it's a selective alpha blocker which selective alpha 1 or alpha 2 it's an alpha 1 selective alpha blocker what is the uh, advantage of this prazosin as compared to non selective alpha blockers that's comparing to the adverse effects of these drugs the adverse effects of prazosin the most important one is reflux tachycardia 
reflux tachycardia which has been seen to be even though it is lesser than the non-selective alpha blockers even though it is lesser than the non-selective alpha blockers it is clinically more relevant is that so sir definitely yes definitely. Yeah, especially i think we uh, prazosin uh, has commonly been prescribed in terms of younger individuals yes young hypertension especially hypertension which is refractory also like uh, which is not controlled by dual agents you know one of the drugs which actually help us is prazosin prazosin yeah and the next one we can also expect uh, one important uh, adverse effect of course everyone would have known it that is first dose phenomena first dose phenomena associated with the postural hypotension uh, describing more about fdp is not going to be uh, uh, useful in this particular session in this particular thing it has been detailedly uh, ex uh, explained in the session where we have explained about alpha blockers again now let's move to the third option guys here the third option is spironolactone so what is actually spironolactone we have spironolactone spironolactone instead of calling it as a potassium sparing diuretic now we please call them as aldosteron receptor antagonistic agent because that explains the mechanism of uh, this particular drug potassium sparing diuretic is a name which can be given based on the effect which it is producing based on the mechanism which it is going to produce we can better call it as aldosteron yes. receptor blocker it's an aldosteron receptor blocker but what is the issue here why don't uh, uh, we use it why because uh, recently in uh, INICT, one question was asked regarding this. Uh, spironolactone is one of the best drugs, potassium sparing diuretics or aldosterone receptor antagonist. It's one of the best drugs to be given in terms of edema due to cirrhosis. Edema due to cirrhosis, spironolactone is one of the best drugs to be administered. Uh, even it can also be given in terms of congestive cardiac failure. It, moreover, it has also been treat, uh, is one of the best drugs to be used in terms of resistant hypertension. To be added as and to be given as an add-on drug. We also have certain other drugs. I think, uh, sir, uh, is the most uh, uh, best person uh, to uh, give the give, give some points about what are the different drugs which can be used in resistant hypertension. Yeah. I will finish off this and I will just uh, uh, give this to you. And spinalactone also tends to produce an important adverse effect and that is increased potassium levels, hyperkalemia and gynecomasia. Yeah. Hyperkalemia and gynecomasia, especially. This spironolactone tend to produce not in all the patients, but only when the pre-treatment levels of potassium is more than 4.5 millimole per liter, they are more prone to land up in hyperkalemia. So the pre-treatment levels, if it is more than 4.5 millimole per liter, those patients are more prone to land up in hyperkalemia. Now, we just went through all the other options. We'll come towards the answer for this question. And that answer is what, guys? Yes, tell me the answer. That is, tell me. Saturn. So tell me Saturn, what's the mechanism, guys? Simpler, right? We know the name from the name itself, we can guess it. What's the last five letters here? We have A R T A N. Angiotensin receptor antagonistic agent. It's an angiotensin receptor antagonistic agent. We have drug which can be used for pulmonary arterial hypertension. So I think uh, we have Bosentan. Bosentan. Yeah. So in comparison, Bosentan. The name is going to be ending with N-tan, which means it's an endothelin receptor antagonistic agent. Here, this is not N-tan, this is R-tan, which means angiotensin receptor antagonistic agent. Very simple. This telmisatan is one of the best drugs to be used in terms of a hypertensive individuals with comorbidities like diabetes mellitus. Why is that? Because as Sir has uh, uh, beautifully explained it while explaining the case scenario itself, this tend to prevent the progression of diabetic ne uh, nephropathy. So uh, it prevents the development of diabetic nephropathy and that's also one of the reasons why uh, this drug is going to be the uh, answer for this question because the patient has already been uh, ended up in uh, plus one albuminuria. Yeah, albuminuria and he's having a diabetes for the past three years. Yeah, he's also a known diabetic, a uh, long-standing diabetic and HbA1c also is little Seven. bit in the high level. And uh, uh, again, we have to remember again the similar area like what we have seen with spinal lactone guys. Tell me Satan also tends to produce hyperkalemia. We have to make sure the patient's uh, uh, renal artery are normal because in terms of bilateral renal artery stenosis, it is going to be contraindicated. This is a very, very important point. Yes, actually one. we can uh, deal with the separate case itself. Right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we can have that as a separate case uh, scenario itself. And apart from that, what about, uh, uh, why did we use? Because we, can, we could have used enalapril, right, in the options. But we didn't use enalapril. Instead, we opt for telmisartan, right? Why is it? Because only one major point is there and that is, Artan drugs tend to produce less cough. 
Atan drugs tend to produce less chances of development of angioedema. Because of these two different points, angiotensin receptor blockers are pharmacologically preferred than AC inhibitors in treatment for hypertension. What, what do you think, sir? Definitely. In routine practice also, the same we follow, sir. Which is why always, you know, pharmacology is always linked to medicine. Routine practice also in view of the lesser adverse effects as an antihypertensive, we'll always prefer ARBs. Yes, sir. So, uh, so uh, as per uh, this uh, four options is concerned, we have explained about the individual drugs and its uh, things. But we have just, it is not enough, no, right? Uh, it's always not enough regarding medicine and the pharmacology. We just need to know a little bit other point and that is, we have known that telmesartin is the answer for this question. But how do we give? Is it the current drug of choice? Is it the monotherapy or combination therapy? Uh, I just need uh, uh, sir's opinion on this, sir. What do you think? About so, that? sir, you know, uh, you have given us the, uh, you know, the various agents, the pros and cons. So, you know, I just like to put into the students, like in routine practice, how do we sequence the various antihypertensive, which drug to start? So, you've got to know that there are certain guidelines. In fact, there are multiple guidelines. You have guidelines by the American Heart Association. You have the European Society guidelines. There is the guideline by the International Society of Hypertension. What I want you students to know is, no need to know every guideline in depth. No. One of the guidelines, all these are actually standard guidelines, but a more clinically pragmatic guideline is the ISH. You know, Pan India, majority of the cardiologists would actually follow the either the ISH guidelines or the European than the AHA for hypertension. Okay, I'm talking of hypertension. So, a few points that you should know I regarding have, uh, decrease the burden of this. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> we can just follow at least one Guide. of uh, the guidelines. Yeah. Years, so the ISH guidelines, sir, of 2020. So the guideline actually tells you certain points. Number one. Is a surprise, surprise for some students. Well, that in cases of a newly detected hypertension, the guideline says you start not just with one agent, you start with a combination. Okay. So the combination they suggest to start off with, okay, is a combination of A plus C. So what is this A? A is actually angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors or ARB, either of this, okay. And um, C is actually a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, okay. So, step 1 will be a combination of A plus C in low dose, okay, A plus C in low dose. So, though I said it is a combination, it will be given as a single pill. So, you have got combination pills. FDCs. Yeah. So, a common example is you give Telmisartan 40 milligram plus amlodipine 5 milligram. You have these combination pills available. So, a low dose, tell me for Telmisartan 40 and amlo 5, this is actually the first line. Okay. Now, suppose with this first combination, it is not getting controlled. What next? The guideline says step up. Okay. Step up. So, when you step up, you will be thinking of A plus C, the same group of agents, but at high dose. High dose. So, which means it must be like, uh, say, a uh, telmisartan, 80 milligram. And again, you can increase the dose of amylodipine to 10 milligram. Okay. So, you have these combinations available. Okay. So, A plus C low dose, if not controlled, A plus C high dose, increase the dose. Remember, it's given as a single pill. Now, suppose it is not getting controlled. Then you go to the next step, sir. So, next step, step 3 is um, you actually, you, you have given already A plus C high dose. Next is you go for A plus C at high dose and you are adding the next drug. And what is going to be the next drug? It is D. What is this D? This D is standing for Thiazide or thiazide like diuretic. Okay. Thiazide or thiazide like diuretic. Okay. So, this is step number 3. Okay. Very clear. Okay. Now, I have given diuretic also. But still, no response. The blood pressure is not getting controlled. 
So in such a scenario, when the patient is on three antihypertensives, one of which is a diuretic and all these drugs are at their maximum tolerated dose, then you give it a term. Sir has mentioned that term. What is that term? Resistant hypertension. So if it is not responding to this combination, you call it a resistant hypertension. So if there is a resistant hypertension as step 4, A plus C plus D, in addition to that, you will add another agent. And that agent for step 4, the agent of choice, again sir mentioned that. What is that? Spironolactone. Okay, spironolactone. So not just spironolactone, you can think of other agents as well, like a clonidine or even a beta blocker. Okay, or even drugs like prasocin, you can think of adding other agents as well. So this is the sequence in which we will actually go. Okay. So remember A plus C low dose, A plus C high dose, A plus C plus D and then finally resistant hypertension adding a spironolact. Sir, this is the sequence that we actually follow. But I want to tell all dear students one thing. These are guidelines. In certain scenarios, you know, you would want certain modifications. Even the guideline tells that, sir. For example, though I said A plus C is first line, suppose we have got a patient with a cardiac failure. So he might actually require a diuretic earlier. So maybe he's in a fluid overload state, you know, his heart is not pumping well, you've got to get in a diuretic. So clinical decisions might change depending on the associated comorbidities, it depends. But this is the general guideline that you should follow. Now whether it be ISH or AHA, everybody now suggests a combination. You must be asking me, sir, sir, does that mean that it is a combination for every patient? Well. There are certain scenarios, sir, where you can try for single agent. That single agent, that is single agent like tell me certain alone. So when do you go for a single agent alone is, um, see, the patient is not having, patient is not having HMOD. This is a new term, sir. So HMOD stands for hypertension mediated organ damage because um, see hypertension when untreated can have its implications in various body systems it is a multi-system disorder so you can have uh, a hypertensive retinopathy a hypertensive uh, renal injury leading on to a, a chronic kidney disease you can have a myocardial infarction so there are different vascular catastrophes that can happen right so whenever there is uh, hypertension mediated organ damage the old terminology was end organ damage now we call it HMOD so if the patient is not having HMOD if the patient is not having significant family history of hypertension okay mother father no hypertension okay okay and no other significant vascular comorbidities which means, you know, conditions like diabetes. So if you have got a patient who has a diabetes, he's a smoker, he's an alcoholic. So these are all vascular comorbidities. So then, you know, you'll have to go for a dual agent. But these are the scenarios, sir, where we'll go for single agent. I have a doubt, sir. Here. <clears throat> what if here we have propranolol, we have prazosin. What if the option C is telmisartan? Okay. Option D is telmisartan with uh, 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 amlodipine. Yeah. In this condition, what drug would you, which, which will be the right option? So basically, see, I've already told you that uh, the patient is a diabetic. So this is one patient who has a comorbidity like a diabetes also. So in such a scenario, you will have to go for a combination. So this is one logic you have got to apply. Like as sir said, if it is a patient, say a 60, 70 year old, you know, elderly is coming to you. No other previous comorbidities, no significant family history. In that patient, there is no need to start straight away on a combination. Maybe you can try a single agent that way. Yeah. But this condition warrants a combination therapy. Exactly. So if you come across an option with uh, amlodipin uh, with a combination with telmisartan, we can always go for that option instead of telmisartan. Exactly. That's exactly. what the take-home point is. Exactly. So I think, sir, you know, we have been uh, able to give them an overview of the selection of the uh, antihypertensive agents because, uh, again, I reiterate one thing. I've told this uh, before in the video, but I reiterate 
see always whenever you put it into practice your pharmacology has to be strong sir you know my professor used to say something to all residents while you know we were training that see when you prescribe a drug if you do not do know the adverse effect of that drug don't prescribe you've got to know everything about that drug and then only you can confidently prescribe you can follow up the patient see sir was telling about each and every drug when to give and when not to give that is also important so thank you everyone uh, for joining stay tuned for more such videos thank, thank you thank you so much guys